Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll just give it a moment as usual as everybody is, is joining into the Grand Rounds today. I hope everybody's having a, a very good week. Um, we'll have a, a few usual updates and we'll start with that first. Uh, Dr. Pinsky, thanks as always for being with us. He's gonna update us a little bit on some numbers and just a brief update on the variants. Thank you, Errol. Good morning, everyone. So I'll give a brief update on the uh, variants. Uh, we go our usual graph and as you can see we are still uh, essentially all uh, delta variant um, shown in yellow here and then on the right side uh, nearly a hundred percent of our uh, of our uh, cases are the delta variant um, the good news is uh, our positivity rate as you can see in the upper corner it is down to about 2.85%, the seven-day uh, average positivity rate. Uh, that's down from our peak of close to 5% uh, last month. I also want to briefly um, update on uh, a new variant of interest that you may have seen in the news. Uh, this is called Mu. Um, it was uh, elevated to a variant of interest by the WHO on um, the 30th of August. Uh, this is Pangolineage B1621. I briefly talked about this um, a number of weeks ago before it had a WHO label. Uh, it has mutations uh, N501Y E484K that are in common with uh, the beta and uh, gamma uh, uh, variants of concern, uh, but it also has another spike mutation R346K. It was first identified in Colombia. Um, our first case was on May 27th. Um, the total uh, number of whole genome sequences we've seen for this variant, uh, we've seen 15 cases that have been confirmed. Uh, overall, MU accounts for less than 1% uh, cases globally and in the United States. However, in Colombia and Ecuador, it, it accounts for uh, substantially more, uh, substantially higher percentage of the cases. Uh, so we will continue to monitor this variant and uh, update you all on uh, Grand Rounds if this should uh, uh, increase in uh, numbers. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pinsky. I want to next uh, transition over to an important update. Uh, many of you have already been aware and may have seen the email that just went out from our from our department chair, Dr. Harrington, uh, just a few minutes before we started Medical Grand Rounds. Our community is in a lot of uh, hurt right now. Uh, we recently uh, learned of the passing of our uh, medicine resident, Dr. Brooke Gapster, and, um, and we want to take a few minutes, a little while now, to to uh, honor her. And this is the beginning of a process where we'll be doing we'll be doing to to remember and honor her. I want to turn it over uh, to Dr. Harrington right now to start that off, Dr. Harrington. So, uh, so thanks, Errol. As Errol has, uh, has indicated, the past few days have been a painful one for the Department of Medicine faculty, staff, residents, fellows, uh, because we lost one of our own. We lost a bright, promising, vibrant member of the community, Dr. Brooke Gabster, um, after a very courageous battle with, uh, with cancer this past weekend. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Ron to maybe to share with you some reflections. Some reflections. And then Ron and will then Ron will turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so as you've all heard, it's really with tremendous sadness this morning that we let you all know about the death of one of the members of our residency family. Uh, Brooke Abster began as a resident in our program in 2018, passed away on Saturday, surrounded by loved ones after a two and a half year battle with osteosarcoma. But it's certainly with tremendous pride and with many fond memories that we'll remember the life of a truly, truly special person, one who made such an impact on so many people here in our residency program and throughout the Stanford community. For those who didn't know Brooke, she was born in and grew up in Missouri, and she then earned her undergraduate degree from Princeton. She worked for Deloitte Consulting for three years before deciding to pursue a medical career. She enrolled at the University of Chicago. And there she was an absolute superstar as a medical student. She uh, graduated at the very, very top of her class. And she had developed a passion for global health and global equity through her work abroad, both as an undergraduate and as a medical student, spending time working in South Africa, Thailand, Germany, and Ghana. 
when she matched with us in 2018 as a member of the Global Health Track, we knew that we had matched someone truly special, someone destined to be a future leader. And it gives me great joy to look back on the pictures you see of Brooke at her match day ceremony with her friend Jessica in turn orientation and even her irreverent first ever tweets posted right after day one of internship. I was saying just yesterday that I haven't known many people in my life who had a 100% approval rating from everyone they interacted with, but Brooke was that person. Uh, to know Brooke was to like Brooke. She lit up every room she was in. Um, as Michelle Barry recently described, she lit up a room like an airport runway with bright lights on. She exuded a natural warmth that came through and her ever-present smile, as you see, a smile that never seemed to disappear, even with all that life very unfairly brought her way. And on top of all that, she was brilliant. She was motivated by the highest ideals and she worked tirelessly. I cannot begin to imagine all she would have accomplished in her career and in her life. It's been heart-wrenching for all of us to follow Brooke's journey over the last two and a half years as her disease inexorably progressed. And yet it was less than a year ago that in the throes of chemotherapy, she chose to come back to residency part-time, not conceding any part of her life to the illness she was battling. She actually spent her first couple of weeks in the heart failure clinic where I work. And despite nearly two years of rust, despite being away for so long, Brooke was still a natural. She instantly connected with patients. She had that innate clinical sense that all great clinicians seem to have. She even wrote beautiful notes. My oh my, what an impact she would have had as a physician, as a researcher, as an advocate, and this incredible human being. She taught me and all of us so much over the three years of knowing her, and I'm truly grateful that she was able to touch so many lives in our community. Brooke had the support not only of a wonderful network of friends here at Stanford, but from an amazing family, including her parents, her sister Krista, and her loving husband Steve. And we'll follow up in the coming weeks with ways all of us in the community can celebrate Brooke's life and how we hope to continue to remember her and honor her life for the years to come. Now, for those who haven't read it, I can't recommend highly enough a perspective piece, which Brooke wrote for JAMA's A Piece of My Mind series, published about six months into her diagnosis uh, back on November 5th, 2019. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to close my remarks by sharing a brief excerpt. Despite the turmoil of emotions I now associate with the hospital, I still love my career in medicine. If given the opportunity to care for patients again, I will be a better doctor. In the meantime, I hope to share what I've learned as a patient with interns like the one I met in the emergency department. I've made their mistakes and experienced the same challenges. Now I wanna help them feel what it's like to be me, understand how all consuming this diagnosis is, know my fears of losing my independence and being told I'm out of treatment options and see the list of all I've already given up and everything else I'd readily sacrifice for cure. I want to show them how critical their presence is I need them to know how much their words matter. Thank you, Brooke, for all that you shared with us. We will miss you dearly. Thank you, Dr. Tellis. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to get through this. I, um, I thought I would, but now that uh, hearing Dr. Watala speak has made it a little harder. So I apologize in advance if it's, um, if it's a little challenging for me to get through my comments right now. Um, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to say a few words about Brooke this morning. Um, though in these situations, it truly feels impossible to know what to say or how to say it. And I certainly don't know how to put into words the tremendous amount of grief of losing her not just as her friend, but as a community. In addition to being, as Dr. Watellis uh, referred to her, an incredible, brilliant, and wonderful human being, she was also a very dear friend of mine and the first person I met my intern year. And over the past two and a half years since her diagnosis, I watched her go through each day with just such incredible resilience and hope in the face of a truly terrible diagnosis. She's the kind of person who texted me from her hospital bed multiple times to wish me good luck on something or happy birthday or just ask how I was doing. And I, I also uh, would highly recommend her JAMA article um, if you haven't already read it because I feel like the words in that article are just uh, a beautiful way of summing up what I think meant so much to her. 
and what was important to her. She wanted us as physicians to be very mindful always of the words that we use with our patients. And she really wanted to be treated every day, not like she was dying, but that in that moment that she was alive. And I, I take that to heart every day. She never lost hope for the promise of one more day, of one more minute of time. And she was just, I, I, I hesitate to use this word, but it just truly sums up. She was just such a fighter always. In her reflection that she wrote, she said that she was terrified of doctors growing immune to tragedy and that she wanted her physicians to be as driven by the fear of her death as she was. And that hope and determination that drove her inspired me every day and continue to do so. And there's one line from that paper that has always resonated with me, which was racing to offer silver linings and positive spins doesn't help, but joining the uncomfortable space of my suffering does. And with this, she taught me to feel empowered to join the uncomfortable space of suffering, to be driven to help my patients as if they were me. I'm so grateful for everything she taught me, the hope she instilled in me, and I'm going to miss her. The world is truly a little bit less bright without her in it. Thank you. Dr. Peterson, thank you. Um, for those beautiful words, Dr. Vitalis and Dr. Harrington. Um, I, I've been trying to figure out how do we transition over after remembering Dr. Gapster into what our grand rounds is today. And I decided we don't. And, and, and by that, I mean, this is just the beginning of us beginning to remember and honor Dr. Gapster. We will continue to do so in many ways and update our community as we do so. Um, if anybody wants to leave any thoughts or comments, we purposely left the, the chat open today. Thank you for those uh, comments that have come through um, and, and thank you for those, those words. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Harmon, um, appropriately so, um, who has also been involved in a new Dr. Gapster well. And um, we're gonna, um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, uh, to transition when appropriate, Dr. Harmon. I know that this has affected you greatly as well, um, but I think it's appropriate that you're, you're running Grand Rounds today and thank you for being with us and thank you for everything you've done. Thanks, Dr. Ozdaga. Um, I, I hope that we can all just take a moment right now of silence and remembering Brooke and honoring her light and um, just this beloved person in our community. Thank you for all taking a moment um, as we transition. And there will be more to honor Dr. Gapster, to honor Brooke. Um, so uh, this is Women in Medicine Month um, and uh, we continue to celebrate and also to kind of catalyze um, our community around um, the experiences of women in medicine. Um, I'm just gonna highlight very quickly several things before introducing um, our fantastic speaker. Um, briefly, next week will be our inclusion rounds on the intersectionality and the experience of Black women in medicine. Um, I'll make sure that the website is in the chat for everyone to go to to register for that. Um, continue to, to um, take a look and keep your radar out for all the features on our different media 
um, outlets, um, including our newsletter. Um, actually, I was glad to see Dr. Busing. Um, uh, she's a wonderful kind of takeover piece in the newsletter this week on lactation culture. Next slide. So if you can advance. Um, I, I know this is often hard to remember, but there will actually be an invite that goes out um, for calendars for our Women in Medicine annual photo. It'll be in person at the Clark Center Steps um, on September 22nd next week at noon and then virtually at 4 p.m. Um, wear red, wear your white coat. Um, looking forward to seeing you. And then our upcoming Grand Rounds, both celebrating Women in Medicine as well as Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, as you can see, uh, Doctor next week will be Dr. Dan um, Lillianquist, um, who is uh, from Intermountain Healthcare. Um, the week after that will be Dr. Narjus Duma from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And then October 6th will be Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, um, our very own um, dean and uh, in our Office of Faculty Diversity and Development um, here in Stanford. And it is now my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amanda Deutsch. Uh, Dr. Deutsch is an Associate Professor of uh, Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, so not far. And she is the Medical Director of the UCSF Gender Affirming Health Program. Dr. Deutsch received her undergraduate degree from Binghamton University and the State University of New York, and went on to complete her MD at Rosalind Franklin University, the Chicago Medical School. She then completed her emergency medicine training at Los Angeles County Harbor um, UCLA Medical Center, as well as her uh, MPH from UCLA. Uh, Dr. Deutsch is a leader and recognized expert in transgender health who has written numerous peer-reviewed publications and is a nationally and internationally known speaker on a range of transgender health topics. She is the president-elect for the U.S. Professional Association for Transgender Health and is the lead author for the primary care chapter in the upcoming eighth revision of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care. She's on the editorial boards for the journals um, LGBT Health and Transgender Health. She's also the faculty lead for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Data, or SOGI, at UCSF Health and directs system-wide strategy on transgender health sorry, transgender health there. She has served as a principal um, or co-investigator for a number of research and capacity building projects in transgender medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deutsch. Her talk is titled Transgender Adult Health in Clinical Medicine, the State of the Science. Dr. Deutsch. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. And I will just get my slideshow share set up here. Uh, thank you for having me. This is a great honor, and I'm uh, really just really glad to hear that Stanford is interested in learning more about this and hosting me. Thank you very much to my neighbors to the south. So um, I'm going to move maybe a little quickly through some sections, just timing-wise, um, given the, the way that the hour is, is working out. But uh, I will attempt to leave some time for discussion at the end. And then again, I'm just a short ride up the 280. So if anyone has any questions, you can always um, contact me. Um, so I just don't have any disclosures. We, everything, unfortunately, in the field of transgender health is effectively off label. And just so putting that disclaimer out there. So a brief outline of what we'll try to cover in the next 35 minutes. Um, we'll talk about some terminology and just defining the size of the transgender population. We'll discuss some social determinants and health disparities, and we'll speak a little bit about how to make your clinic safe space and, and a, a place that transgender people want to access care. We'll discuss SOGI data a little bit, and then we'll pivot to some more clinically oriented topics. First, just some supporting evidence for offering gender affirming treatments. And then we'll touch on topics of cardiovascular disease and, and cervical cancer uh, screening considerations and the, the context of transgender clinical care and end with some discussion of some mortality outcome data. Uh, so just very briefly, terminology, a transgender person has a gender identity that differs from the sex that was written on their original birth certificate. There are some uh, additional uh, definitions and <clears throat> don't wanna get too into the granularity here because uh, this is a moving target. It changes frequently and different uh, sub populations within the, the kind of broader gender diverse population may have different outlooks on terminology. 
Um, but broadly speaking, a trans man or a transgender man, a trans male, or a transmasculine person would be someone with a male or masculine spectrum identity who is assigned female at birth. And then conversely for a terminology relating to trans feminine spectrum people. Terms like non-binary or uh, genderqueer describe people who have a range of identities that lie outside of the binary. These are folks who may say I identify as neither male nor female or as both or as something entirely different. And again, recognizing that terminology could be an entire graduate level course in itself and taking uh, a cultural humility approach to this, which cultural humility being allowing the person in front of you or the culture in front of you to define itself and to um, follow that lead. So if someone you're interacting with presents you with terminology that's totally different from what you see on this compact slide, then that is what I would go with for that person's uh, interactions. So what about these terms, gender identity, sexual orientation, gender expression? These, these, all of these terms are terms that are out there. And so I thought I'd uh, define them a bit for you. So your gender identity is how one self-identifies inside. It's really what's in your mind. It's how do you feel that you fit into the world? And so that again, could be female, it could be male, non-binary, gender queer, or a whole bunch of other uh, terms that people may use. Gender expression is really kind of your outward presentation of gender. And this one is a bit more complicated because gender expression and gender identity are not always lined up at the same point on like a spectrum of masculinity, femininity. <clears throat> um, that might be because someone just uh, maybe identifies very strongly as female or male, but has an androgynous gender expression because that's how they feel comfortable moving through the world. Or it could be that someone is not at a point in their life where they're feeling comfortable aligning their gender expression with their gender identity. They haven't come out, they haven't um, be begun undergoing gender affirming medical treatments that are important to them. And then your sexual orientation really is different. It is a multi-dimensional representation of your sexuality, but while there are relationships between gender identity and sexual orientation, and in particular relationships when you start thinking about structural factors, discrimination, uh, social determinants and health disparities, <clears throat> as well as some commonality for the communities. And also, depending on the culture you're in and the language you're speaking and the, the region of the world you're in, there can be some overlaps. And also many transgender people and non-binary people are also sexual minorities. Uh, at the kind of purest sense of the word, again, not getting into a gradual level course, at the purest uh, kind of most definition, these really are separate dimensions. And so the, the take home here would be, you wouldn't ask someone if they are gay, straight, bisexual, or transgender, because that would be like asking if you are a car, boat, airplane, or apple. They're really kind of different axes of, uh, and dimensions of, of identity measurement. So how many transgender people are there? Um, so this is a table I put together for a paper from a few years ago. Um, and uh, you, you can see that uh, this is number per 100,000. So just put three, decimal, uh, three numbers in decimal land here and you'll get uh, going right down the line. So stratified random sample of Boston high school students, 1.6%, uh, random digit dialing in Massachusetts, 0.45%, sub cohort in the nurses health study, 0.33%, national sample of New Zealand high school students, 1.2%. So the, the take home here and, uh, you know, can't, don't want to get again too much time into the population size topic, but there are there are studies from certain older studies that looked at uh, clinic based samples primarily in in countries in Europe that have um, public health care systems, and they they were not population level samples, and they were finding numbers like thirty and hundred thousand, and those were grossly undermeasured and repeatedly study after study. So here's one actually that just just looking at within the BRFSS the Behavior Risk Factors uh, Surveillance Survey. Uh, here in the US. And you can see again, <clears throat> for states where that, uh, <clears throat> that question is asked on the BRFSS, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the percentages again are in the, you know, kind of half percent roughly range. And, uh, and that, that is aligned with um, other point estimates that are out there. So basically like somewhere between 0.25 and 2% of the human population is probably on some kind of gender spectrum. And um, we're not seeing more transgender people in the actual population of humans, 
because of something in the water or trends in society. We're seeing increasing population size because the environment, the cultural environment is making people more comfortable to come out and present as such. People have the language and the framework in which to identify as such. So what are some of the social determinants that impact transgender people? So there's actually, you know, unfortunately it kind of takes up the whole slide and I could probably go on to several more, but um, many of the social determinants that impact minority groups uh, are at work here for specifically transgender people. And um, all of these have been, you know, are kind of clearly tied into a range of health outcome uh, considerations uh, through a number of mechanisms, including a minority stress uh, mechanism, which I'll mention in a later slide. Um, but I did want to point out that uh, we're going to talk about HIV in a little bit. Uh, you know, some of these things like high rates of incarceration, lack of employment protection options, uh, you know, these are the lack of legal protections, unstable housing, these things are all interactive. You know, so if there are 30 some odd states in this country where it's legal to fire somebody on the basis of their gender identity or their sexual orientation or deny them housing or deny them employment. So if you live somewhere where somebody can say, I'm not going to hire you because you're trans, maybe you live in a state where it's very difficult to change your legal identity documents so you can't even kind of be stealth about the fact that you're trans um, and you're experiencing all this discrimination, you may wind up having to get into sex work. Um, so a lot of these uh, shame, discrimination, emotional, physical trauma may result in behavioral health issues that result in substance use for self-medication, lack of access to appropriate psychiatric care. Uh, so these things are really all very interrelated and a lot of the uh, kind of final outcome behaviors, high risk of HIV, high rates of incarceration, high rates of behavioral health issues, homelessness. These are all driven by a range of, of these factors. And I think it's really important to, to think about that. So <clears throat> what do we know about health outcomes and health disparities in the trans population? So obviously this is a ginormous slide with a great deal of numbers that I'm not going to go through in any detail, but I wanted to put it up here because Fortunately, the authors of this paper, um, and this is actually, this comes from the same BRFSS uh, paper that I showed you a few slides ago with that map of the US, um, and the citation is actually right here on the side. So the authors of this paper have conveniently turned this into a graphic display because everywhere that there's something in bold is a statistically uh, significant difference. And so if you, if you look at this slide, so what they're doing, and you know, I'm, not, I'm not thrilled about this male to female and female to male terminology, that's kind of older school. Um, it's a kind of a clunky term that includes the birth assigned sex in identifying someone. But this paper was published in 2018. That, you know, this paper was probably prepared in the mid 2010s and, and terminology hadn't really caught up yet. So we'll give the authors a pass. But uh, the point I wanna make is that as you, as you kind of look at this, this side of the slide here, we have um, trans feminine people being referenced to cis males and may be less effective to reference to cis females because you really want to compare uh, trans feminine people to uh, cis males is, is my opinion because you're looking at what are the effects of hormones or you know, what would have happened to them if, if they had not taken hormones and then we'll talk more about that in a moment. But, and then here uh, trans, um, transgender males and then they have a kind of a, a grouped gender non-binary of any uh, gender spectrum, masculine or feminine. What you can see here, if you just look over here, there's more bold over here and the numbers are bigger. So, and these are all just a range of, of health outcomes. So, so we're seeing a number of health disparities in general. And then we're seeing actually a concentration of higher health disparities among non-binary people. And uh, you know, this, this describes a, a much bigger issue, which is that even within populations, there are subpopulations that experience even higher rates of disparities probably related to higher rates of stigma, shame, lack of community and discrimination, because both within the trans and non-binary and trans world, as well as in the broader society, where society may say, okay, I can understand your assigned male at birth, you identify as female, fine, I can deal with that. But I don't understand how you can say I'm not male or female, what do you mean? And that's that extra level. And then we see this in sexual minorities too. We see that bisexual people often have higher rates of a range of behavioral health and substance use issues. and it's and and it's because, in part, because of this, well, wait, I can understand you're attracted to men or I understand you're attracted to women, but both, you know, what's going on here? These are the levels of discrimination and stigma that people experience. So just wanted to put this up here as a um, graphic um, display. 
So HIV, again, HIV is related to survival sex work. HIV is related to many of those social determinants that I showed you earlier. This uh, paper is several years old, but it is really important uh, data, and I think it illustrates the data the point very well. Uh, <clears throat> this was a meta-analysis looking at uh, lots of different studies across the world. They came up with a pooled worldwide estimate of HIV prevalence in transgender women of 19%. U.S. is actually right around that same uh, figure. So we're kind of at the world average. Um, we can drill down into why places like Pakistan have very low rates, probably because of significant underreporting. Um, <clears throat> But the take home here is that HIV is very prevalent among transgender women. And then really that prevalence, when you look into subpopulations, that prevalence is really concentrated in transgender women of color who are experiencing multidimensional and intersectional uh, health disparities. This is a framework developed by a colleague of mine at UC San Francisco, Dr. Sebelius, called the Model of Gender Affirmation. And uh, at its core, this model describes associations between uh, so social oppression, stigma, trauma, as well as a de decreased access to and increased need for gender affirmation that transgender people experience that through a mechanism of identity threat results in these high risk contests and risk behavior, which through this model describes um, how basically mixture of stigma, oppression, discrimination, and lack of affirmation of one's gender is directly tied to high-risk sexual behavior context. But you really could link that to high-risk and self-harming behavior context of, of any type. Uh, so it could be engaging in uh, substance use or other um, habituated behaviors like you know, anything from gambling to uh, behaviors that may be considered on what are referred to sometimes as personality spectrum stuff. Um, the red circles here highlight areas in this model where as um, health systems and providers of transgender gender affirming care, which we'll pivot to in a moment, we can actually try to intervene and, and block some of the progression through this model. So how do you create a, a setting where trans and non-binary people want to come to clinic? Well, I mean, I think that th this really would apply to any group that you're attempting to focus healthcare services for. Um, and these are areas where you can do work when you are developing a uh, clinical program. Um, you know, there, a lot of times you'll have um, staff training, a provider training, but do you have any follow-up on that? Do you have any patient-centered measures to, you know, to see how are we doing? You know, we trained staff three months ago about using pronouns. Now we need to ask 200 patients, you know, are people calling you by the right pronoun? Did our, did we need to maybe ch check up on our staff at six months. Do we need to have annual refreshers and updates? Um, and then really getting to some more granularity, like how do you room patients? You know, if a patient is is, is coming in for an elective surgery and they identify as female, um, uh, do they get to room, uh, if, this, if there's a shared bed setting, do they get to room with, a, you know, with, with a female roommate or do they get, how do they get assigned? And what happens if a roommate complains about their, their roommate being trans? Um, do you have ways to respond to that? Cause that kind of stuff happens. Um, and then we're going to talk about SOGI functionality in a moment. So SOGI data, which stands for sexual orientation and gender identity data, there, I see this as uh, really, I mean, this is kind of the focus of my work right now. Um, so I see this as very important, but there's really three domains of why SOGI data collection is so important. So just, just quality improvement. I mean, we, you know, we need to understand the very basics. You know, are our transgender patients more likely to no-show for follow-up appointments in the GI clinic? Um, our, our lesbian patients, uh, less likely to be um, current for breast cancer screening. These just basic bread and butter QI practices. If you don't know who the trans people or the sexual minority people and who the you know, not sexual or and or gender minority people are in your big data database, whatever it is, then you can't make groups to compare the two. Um, research is always the other side of the quality improvement coin. They're effectively the same thing. Uh, just uh, different context. And so really the same issues come up with supporting research. If you wanna put in an R01 or an R21 and you wanna put some preliminary data together and you wanna do a back of the envelope sketch of uh, you know, the percentage of, of non-binary masculine spectrum people at your health system who've been 
diagnosed with uh, a skin disorder in the last 18 months, you, 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 if you don't have those groups to sign, you can't put that prelim data together to apply for the grant, to do the research, which then creates a for feed forward problem because you have less research, which means less additional research and less papers, less funding. So this is really a, a big structural hump we need to get over. And then patient-centered, which for patients is the most important thing. You know, patients don't want to be called by the wrong name and pronoun. They don't want assumptions about sexuality. They don't want to be kept, keep getting asked about, you know, if you have a boyfriend or do you need contraception when they have been in a relationship with the same cisgender female for the last, you know, 22 years. Um, so all of these are really important reasons to not only collect data, but also develop workflows for the data. So I, I've done consulting with a lot of health systems uh, of, of all different kinds, academic to call it student health to just a, a kind of um, private health systems. And a lot of times what happens is, is the functionality is established in the electronic health record. And a lot of times that's with support from the vendor, like Epic has some basic SOGI functionality. And also there are some, some challenges and limitations to Epic's in, built in functionality. But, what, but a lot of times that functionality is built and then it's like, well, we did it. We built the um, SOGI functionality, but <clears throat> there really needs to be like, you know, we have hand washing month and we have, uh, you know, language of translation month. It really needs to be like SOGI month where it really gets baked into the, into the culture of the organization. So this is from a paper that I actually just submitted uh, yesterday, finally, after sitting in my uh, desktop for like two years. Um, uh, where we actually studied at UCSF uh, patient preferences for responding to, to SOGI questions. And I think that there's a big push to collect SOGI data at check-in at the front desk because that's uh, when, you know, the, maybe the most efficient way in the eyes of administrators who are trying to meet metrics. You know, if we ask everybody to check-in, we're going to get as much data as we can. But the problem is, is that that's not a particularly secure or private place to report this information. And also front desk staff may not have the training or the relationship with a patient to answer sensitive questions that may come up about this sensitive data. Cisgender people may be confused about these questions and the desk person may not be able to answer those properly. So we actually asked patients, how would you like to, this is a mix of trans, cis, cis and trans patients of a range of sexualities on both sides. And uh, in the multiple uh, regression analysis, there was no difference by any group for any of these answers. So this is basically universal based on these 300 patients we sampled. And 80% um, of patients wanted some kind of anonymous self-report. And of those 80%, half of them wanted it by some kind of electronic device in the waiting room, and then the rest by either a pen and paper form or online portal. Of the remaining 20% who did not choose anonymous self-report, 10% wanted to do it to their medical provider. 5% didn't want to answer the questions. 4% <clears throat> want to do it with a nurse or medical assistant and only 1% the front desk. So, um, you know, it's, it's, this is an example of where patient desires and preferences are so far out of step with what might make the most sense from a health systems administration perspective. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're doing at UCSF to try and uh, sort out how should we go about doing this. Now, one thing I want to mention just very briefly, you know, measuring gender identity specifically really requires a minimum of two questions to measure gender. Um, the reason is, and uh, this study that was done at, at San Francisco State University a few years ago really uh, very eloquently displays it. They, uh, without getting into the detail, they had two cohorts of psychology students and they asked one group the question, are you male, female, or trans? And then they asked another group, um, what is your gender identity and what sex were you assigned at birth? Assuming the two groups had the same, um, you know, were kind of similar in makeup, you can see that when they asked the group, what is your gender identity and what sex were you assigned at birth, that they got twice as many transgender people. Data after data, including internal data we have at UCSF that's being prepared for publication supports the fact that if you, if you, if you don't ask these more than one question, you're going to miss a lot of transgender people who, when given the choice, are you male, female, or trans? Are going to say they're male or female because that may be how they identify. So th there's a lot of talk about the two-step question, which is what gender, what is your gender identity, and what sex were you assigned at birth? But actually, that has never really been psychometrically studied. And so I've been really pushing, and a lot of us are pushing for more study in this area, and I'm working on that. Um, but you really need at least two questions to measure gender and just how are those questions structured? 
and what order and you use it when using electronic technology can you skip patterns and things like that so um, that's an area for further exploration and then there's some other important gender identity measures such as your chosen name your pronouns and uh, organ inventory chosen name and pronoun are really important because that's what patients are experiencing on a minute to minute casual interaction when they're moving through the health system and then organ inventory is really important and we're really behind on the functionality for this but this ideally would be set up where there would be a running organ inventory that would be tied to the surgical history. So you have a hysterectomy, the organ inventory automatically gets updated, and then all of that drives uh, health maintenance decision support. That unfortunately is, is, a, is a bit far off, far afield from where the current state of EHR functionality is, but uh, you know, efforts are underway to improve that. Uh, and then lastly, this, this is, uh, you know, I think I'm going to skip this because I'm just worried a little about time. We got started a little late because of really important content that got delivered before. So I'm going to actually not get too much into data governance and roll up variables. I just want to skip it. So I think kind of closing out this part and moving into the more biomedical piece, you know, I think in med school, uh, I went, I graduated medical school 20 years ago, you know, and a lot of us just got this kind of like, this was your sexual and gender minority module. Do you have sex with men, women, or both? And clearly, this is not an ideal way to ask. It doesn't tell you all you need to know. It's not inclusive of a range of uh, sexual orientations or gender identities. And so this is like an onion model that I, I like to describe of, of how to take a sexual history that sometimes occurs over the course of several visits. And you're peeling an onion. You know, are you a sexual person? Do you have a sexual orientation? Then maybe, OK, you know, how would you describe it? Do you have a term used to describe it? Are you currently sexually active? Are you active with more than one partner? thinking about ways to ask these questions of all patients. If you only ask people who you think or know, or know are gender minorities or sexual minorities, you'll never know who's not a sexual or gender minority. And then you again, lack the ability to create that comparison group to look for disparities and to make other comparisons. So speaking very briefly about gender affirming treatments and procedures, there are a range of medical, surgical and other procedures that transgender people may seek. Um, why do we offer it? There have been a number of studies that have found that hormone therapy improves scores of anxiety, depression, and social functioning, and also that surgery improves, improves range of outcomes. However, data in the surgical outcome area is somewhat limited, um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but the take home is we need more research specifically on surgical outcomes. So the supporting evidence for gender affirming care Rates of uh, regret, medical malpractice, very low. There's a lot of value added when bundling with other services. So patients who are feeling motivated to begin addressing gender needs and affirming their gender medically may be more motivated to come in and, and get things like diabetes taken care of or get their colon cancer screening. And all of these gender affirming interventions are defined as medically necessary by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. So uh, a costing study was done. It was found that there's roughly at a 10 year uh, mark, there's a um, $10,000 per quality adjusted life year cost to offer the full spectrum of gender affirming care. In the United States, the $100,000 per added quality adjusted life year is the willingness to pay threshold. So, you know, this analysis also found that to cover the entire US trans population for the full range of gender affirming interventions, it would cost 1.6 cents per member per month. Uh, additional. So this stuff is very cost effective because the treatments tend to be cheap. The medications are mostly generic. The surgeries are not particularly complicated with the exception of some of the masculinizing gender affirming uh, uh, genital surgeries. And uh, there are a lot of costs associated with not treating, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's talk briefly about cardiovascular metabolic disorders and, and you know, speaking broadly. This is what I was just talking about. The psychosocial benefits of hormones may include positive lifestyle changes that can reduce obesity, glucose, or lipid disorders. The benefits likely outweigh any potential increased metabolic risks. Minority stress. There is a huge role of minority stress in the development of chronic health conditions. And unfortunately, there has been a lack of data comparing the health risks, uh, the health issues faced by transgender people who are not using hormones compared to cisgender people because as we're gonna talk about some of the health risks that have been identified in people taking hormones are not necessarily proven to be because of hormones and probably are not, and probably are due to the minority stress framework, which involves chronic activation of the adrenal axis and of the stress response, which results in, in both short and long-term changes in body physiology that results in a lot of metabolic um, derangement and health outcome issues that arise. 
Um, and then we talked about a lot of the other lifestyle factors uh, that also are driven by these determinants and that probably have a role here as well. So this is a great study that looked at cardiovascular events in trans people among a large cohort, uh, it's retrospective, a large cohort at uh, three Kaiser sites in Georgia and California. They created a 10 to one, um, but before we get into the data, they created a 10 to one matching uh, group. Every transgender person was 10 to one matched with uh, cisgender male and cisgender female control groups. And um, I think just in the interest of time, let's just talk about the top section right here. So this is among all comers comparing, uh, and they should have put cis men and cis women. We would never compare transgender women to women because transgender is just an adjective modifying women like cisgender or tall or older. So they, you know, if you look here, everything that's in yellow that I highlighted is statistically significant difference. So I don't really know that it makes that much sense to compare VTE stroke and MI from cis, um, cis women to trans women because trans women have had in this cohort a good chunk of time under a testosterone driven system. So I don't even know that that's the greatest comparison. You know, maybe if we had people who started gender transition in their teens, um, it would be more appropriate to make the comparison to cis women. Regardless, you know, you can see here, okay, there's adjusted hazard ratio for thromboembolic disease of a two for both compared to cis males and females. And then there's only a significant difference of stroke and MI compared to cis females, again, in the twofold range. So you could say, hey, that's pretty concerning, you know, twofold. But we always have to calculate the number needed to harm, which this paper did not do. So I took the liberty of doing it for them. And uh, you can see here that the numbers needed to harm are very high. And this is where you have to think about the, the risks of not treating. So in my experience, the number needed to harm for, by withholding gender affirming treatment for someone who wants it is one. And so these, these uh, if you tried to get these down by withholding gender affirming treatment, uh, you'd have a lot more harm on the other side. So much so that it's generally considered unethical to try to pursue like a randomized controlled trial with like placebo hormones to somebody. Uh, we just, we're never gonna be able to do that study because it just would be unethical because there's so much data supporting the role of hormones. Transmasculine people in this particular study, there was um, no statistically significant difference between any group. So that is really reassuring. Now, this is a study that looked, this is a, um, this is a different study. This is from the BRFSS. So again, behavior risk factors as, um, survey. And this is self-report. So this is retrospective self-report, whereas this study was chart data. So in this retrospective self-report, and this is just one snippet from it here, but you can see here, uh, they compared um, different groups to cis male and cis female uh, as a kind of reference group. And you can see that there were statistically significant increases in um, uh, myocardial infarction, for example, among cis men compared to both groups, uh, as well as cis women. So uh, as well as uh, transgender men compared to cis men was statistically significant. And then transgender women and transgender men compared to cisgender women was significant. Don't know again how significant this trans women to cis women comparison is, hard to say. So kind of conflicting data, whereas this study found actually no significant difference between trans women and cis men, but, but did find a difference between trans men and cis women. But this self-report, although the BRFSS has been found to be accurate recall. So I think the, the, the point here is, is that there might be a small signal here, but the most important thing to recognize is the signal is likely small, the numbers needed to harm are high, and the number needed to harm by withholding hormones is very low. So um, what I'm gonna do here very quickly, just give you a couple of take home points on these last two topics, and then we'll leave a couple of minutes for discussion. So I wanted to just touch very briefly on cervical cancer screening. Uh, I will just jump right to the point here in the interest of time. Um, this was a study that I was part of that was based at Fenway Health in Boston. And we looked at um, the performance of a self-collected vaginal HPV swab to a provider collected cervical HPV swab um, because we had some preliminary data and our study confirmed it in a sample of some hundred and some odd trans mass people that patients really prefer self-collection, especially among trans mass populations who may experience a lot higher discomfort with cervical cancer screening. 
And you can see here, you know, I, I'm always much more interested in PPV and NPV than sensitivity and specificity. So, you know, the performance is pretty good. I think that there's still a little work that needs to be done to figure out, you know, well, if the, you know, if the PPV is only 88%, you know, does that mean that we need to have a shared decision making with the patient that, you know, if you do this self swabbing, it's possible you may have a higher rate of a false positive, and then that may require further downstream studies that may be even more invasive, like colposcopy. So, are there other guidelines to come up with? Maybe some triaging uh, approach rather than the pure USP, uh, the pure, um, oh my gosh, uh, the uh, colposcopist is ASC. I'm blanking on it right now, but the, the, the colposcopy people, I don't know why I'm blanking on the name of that society. So, and then kind of related to that and thinking about shared decision-making, this was a sub-analysis that I led within that study that found that, you know, and there are a lot of details in, in the way we constructed this, but the, the take home here is that among people who reported, uh, you know, among the people's most recent three sex partners, if there was a penis involved uh, going into someone's vagina, then the odds ratio of them having a current HPV infection was five. And um, so it's very important to recognize that HPV is sexually transmitted and causes 99% of all cervical cancers. So when we think about um, approaching discussions about uh, cervical cancer screening, as well as future research, we should recognize that it really isn't one size fits all. And there should be some uh, further research on uh, risk and how that ties in. So the last couple of slides here, just a couple of slides I want to put up on mortality, and then we will be done. This is a study from 10 years ago published by the Dutch in their national database. They have huge national databases there. And they looked at uh, cause-specific and all-cause mortality among trans-feminine people compared to cis-male controls and trans-masculine people compared to cis-female contro cis controls. Everything that's in red is statistically significant increase. So you can see 64% increase mortality among ischemic heart disease. So again, you know, think back to what we were talking about, what would be the risk if we'd withheld. Um, the other issue is that of the 51% increased all-cause mortality, almost all of it is because of things like HIV, drugs, suicide. And so these are all these modifiable kind of um, social determinant, uh, stigma-based issues. And this really falls into the background. This is really probably not much there. Trans mass, the only difference in mortality was due to drug use and no other areas. And then uh, I will skip this curve because it's from the same study, but that's the citation if you want it. This just came out, same Dutch group 10 years later, and I'm going to stop right now, but I'm, uh, we can leave this up here if people want to look at it. The take home from this slide is that basically nothing's changed in 10 years. The mortality looks very similar uh, with, the, with the cause specific and the drivers. So at that, uh, let me stop there. And um, I know we're probably only bumping up against a couple of minutes. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we had to shorten things. I think that the content that came before my talk was much more important. And so um, I will stop here and turn it over to Dr. Harmon or others to guide any Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Deutsch, um, for that fantastic talk. Um, I was taking screenshots and, and we'll actually, for folks, we'll have a recording available as well. I'm gonna go directly to Dr. Mahoney, um, who's one of our panelists for our first question, because um, I know she has a hard stop in a few minutes. Dr. Mahoney? Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Dr. Deutsch. This is a very enlightening talk. I learned so much from it. Uh, thank you for all that you're you're doing and spending time with us. Um, you know, at Stanford, a lot of us are wearing the rainbow uh, stickers on our badge to indicate that um, we are open and prepared to take care of the LGBTQ plus population. Do you have any thoughts about any minimal amount of training or preparation? I mean, I just learned so much, uh, you know, today. Um, what other organizations are doing along the lines of um, providing training in the care of this uh, population? And any thoughts on even in medical education at that level, how that um, this uh, this education could be included as a, a core competency? Yeah, that's a great question. I personally do believe strongly that there should be some competency evaluation and, and opportunity to gain that competency behind things like the stickers or, or badges or putting kind of like a certification badge on a clinic's website. Um, 
you know, I think that developing the content and, and getting the bandwidth of staff and faculty to deliver that content is, is a very systems dependent issue where you have to kind of take the temperature of, you know, what, what is the bandwidth and what resources are provided to us, the mandate from the system to, to incorporate such activity. But, you know, I do believe that if a patient is going to see a rainbow sticker on a badge that they have certain expectations and I have experienced situations where well-meaning people with, you know, with the, the little sticker have actually had some kind of missteps and that can create a, a safety and trust issue that arises with the patient. You know, as far as how to develop the curriculum, I mean, I think that there can probably be in less than an hour uh, a year, um, uh, you know, or maybe an hour initial and then a 15 minute brush up, just some content delivered to people so they can understand the very basics about terminology and what are the right and wrong things to say. Um, I know that uh, I had to take a test at UCSF to be allowed to see my Spanish speaking patients without an interpreter. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, you don't want to create a bar where you make people feel that this is onerous and then they just don't want to deal with it. Um, so you have to kind of find that balance point. I think it's, you know, it's, it's really like organizational change and like affecting behavioral change and like winning hearts and minds. And so, but I do at the most core think that something like that is very important to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deutsch. Um, uh, if it's all right, are, if you're able to stay for two or three yeah. minutes, we have yeah, two more I'm questions. Fine. I wanted yeah. to squeeze in. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna to go to Dr. Salas, who is our special advisor for DEI programs in the department. Um, Dr. Salas for the next question. Thank you so much, Dr. George. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I, I hope that a lot of people, including myself, learned so much today from you. We appreciate your time. Um, I have uh, two questions for you. One is sort of a follow up in terms of terminology that you just mentioned. Um, a word that I see a lot on social media is women with an alternate spelling, you know, with uh, W O M X N. And I've seen that be, <clears throat> excuse me, used as an attempt to be more inclusive, but I've been informed that it's actually not inclusive because it suggests, as you said earlier, that trans women are not women. Um, and so I, I wondered what your thoughts are on that, and if you could enlighten us, um, just so we can all make sure we are using or not using that word appropriately. Um, and then the other question was, you know, you talked a lot about um, gathering data on these variables for our patients. Um, and I wondered if you have thoughts on, um, you know, what we should be doing as a healthcare system for our employees. Should we be asking employees these questions um, and in what way? And um, is that, and I'll just, you know, be transparent that I, I think that we should, and I have suggested this to our professional societies as well, and I get a lot of pushback. So um, I was just curious if you could uh, share your thoughts on that. So thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. So the first question I, you know, I haven't, uh, I'm pretty active on social media, but, um, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I might be, I might not be, I might be out of touch with, um, you know, millennial and Gen Z trends. Um, but uh, I haven't seen WOMXN, but I have seen a number of other kind of um, terms thrown around. Uh, you know, I, I'm, the, the responding to that question is probably like a graduate seminar session uh, at, in social sciences, but, you know, I, I lean towards inclusive language that anchors the fact that transgender people can be men or women, they also can be tall, they also can be truck drivers, they also can have orange hair, they also can be from Minneapolis. And so I like to think of transgender or non-binary as an adjective. And that's what, when I, when there was that paper that compared trans feminine people to trans women to women, it's like, well, you can't make that comparison. You can make trans women and cis women. Um, so I hope that answers that question. I mean, I guess my, my one liner would be trans women are women and ideally we would be using the trans as kind of an adjective. Now, as far as um, the question about employees, I do believe strongly in collecting the data uh, I do believe strongly that the data collection would be voluntary, so nobody would be forced. These would not be hard stops. Uh, or from a data, sometimes for like managing missing data, you make a hard stop of you have to answer, I choose not to answer this question. But it would not be a, a required response. Um, problem is, is, and we've had this happen at UCSF, you know, net promoter surveys are done and faculty climate surveys are done. 
And sexuality and gender identity data has been collected in a mix of not at all and incompletely or with non-ideal methodology and has resulted in ongoing continued difficulties in drilling down into these climate surveys and net promoter surveys uh, to figure out where the problems really lie. So I, you know, I, I think that um, uh, for the same reasons that I advocate for collecting these data for patients, I think from a you know, workplace and HR perspective, it's equally important. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Deutsch, for staying a few minutes longer. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, and, uh, and again, we'll be posting um, the recording as well. Um, uh, Dr. Harrington, did you have any last comments? No, I, I, we close? I, just, I, I just want to thank you for uh, spending time with us. Uh, uh, in addition to my chair's role, I'm a cardiologist and uh, the American Heart Association, we've put out two scientific statements in the last couple of years on the cardiovascular health issues. And I think you've summarized it of, of trans people. And I think you've summarized some of the key issues from a cardiovascular perspective quite well. Um, part of the challenge is, is that we don't have enough data to know some of the things we should be doing. So for example, are there groups of individuals in which we ought to be starting aspirin therapy on as a preventive measure? Um, are statins indicated in certain groups of individuals taking hormonal therapies? And we just don't know the answers to those, but I, 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 we've tried to lay out a perspective in these scientific statements and certainly people can find them in our uh, main AHA journal circulation. So thank you for sharing with us and we're delighted that you were here with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I think the point you make about aspirin is really very relevant because yeah, as we've learned recently, aspirin is not a, you know, kind of a, you know, there's a lot of calculus that needs to go into whether any particular individual takes aspirin. And I see a lot of aspirin use in the, out in the world, in the field of trans medicine of just like, well, you're taking hormones and you're 55, I'm going to put you on aspirin. But unfortunately we don't have that granular data to say, well, actually still it's not, you know, from a risk benefit perspective, it's just still not there. So Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I'm hoping that as we continue to develop the field and the functionality and infrastructure to support such, such studies, I'm working with several large institutions to try and create a multi-site registry. Um, we can try to start getting this data together, but yes, thank you very much for that. No, thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us and um, we'll see you next week.